OK, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to our presentation on firefighting lifts. Uh, my name is Paul Hastings and I'm the technical sales director of Iconic Lifts. Um, apologies for the I have a problem. I'm currently in Valencia in Spain, um, so I've had a little bit of an issue with my PowerPoint. So Dean's kindly uh, put in doing that part for me. Um, so if we can go to slide two, please, Dean. So just a little brief on who we are. So um, first, we're Iconic Lifts. We're our clients have proven lift solutions on time. Our company is highly accredited to ISO 9001, 14001, 45001 and Schedule 18 of the Lift Directive. As well as that, we're members of LEA and Safe Contractor. Our team of experts are both VT engineers, lift consultants, allowing our lift projects to run smoothly for both new builds and existing buildings. We as a company, we provide lift consultation, uh, lift design, specification and supply, lift installation and testing, and lift service and general maintenance. Um, if we can go on to the screen, uh, slide three, please. So what we do, um, Iconic Lifts, we specialise in bespoke lifts, um, which in certain circumstances may require reduced headroom, reduced pit depth, and non-standard cabin sizes. Um, our accreditations allow us to explore designs outside the norm with current approvals in place. Our extensive product range includes vertical lift solutions for every market requirement. One of our specialist areas is firefighting lifts, hence us doing this presentation today, um, which we've identified several challenges and we believe helping to inform all relevant personnel and requirements will aid future projects. Iconic Lists have completed several case studies and products projects which we have undertaken that will show um, with new build development requirements and buildings not incorporated to, into the building design. And we go to slide four, please. So in this presentation, you will discover what you need to know regarding firefighting lifts, including the lift standards, building and product requirements, challenges within existing buildings, and how to successfully specify for a firefighting lift. OK, next slide, please. So this presentation is tended for all that may need to commission the installation of a firefighting lift into a new building or an existing one, such as architects, fire consultants, contractors, building owners slash managers. After this session, you'll be able to understand building requirements and the lift requirements to aid specifying for firefighting lifts. OK, next slide, please. So first off, we'll have a look at the lift. If you just go back one for me, sorry. So first off, we'll go through the lift standards. Mechanical lifts are invaluable to fire service personnel. Please consider a firefighting lift if, is, if it is important that their design and construction is understood. Lifts are an essential element in modern high rise buildings. Lifts are regarded as the safest form of vehicular transport in the world. The UK abides by strict safety requirements. The BS81 group of standards has been expanded to call, cover all relevant topics. Next slide, please, Dean. So here you'll see a list of the relevant um, regulations within the lift industry. So just to run through them quickly for you. So BSE and 8121 is for new passenger lift good lifts that are installed into existing buildings, which may include for low pit and low headrooms. BSN, BSN EN 8128 is remote alarm on passenger lifts and good lifts. So that's for emergencies where people need to be able to call out for emergency assistance. Um, 
in 8170 is the accessibility for for persons including persons with disabilities so in 8171 is vandal resistance in 8172 is firefighting lifts which is what we're going to be covering today and in 8173 behavioral lifts in the events of a fire which we'll also go through today um, in 8180 is the safety rules for construction and installation of lifts and in 812050 is the European standards for the design and installation of lifts which is generally your standard regulation for passenger lifts. Um, can we go to the next slide please Dean? Okay so if we go through what the fire standards are so there are two types of standards and what is the difference so in 8173 this is for the behavior of lifts in the event of a fire so the, what this will do is if a fire alarm is triggered the lift will essentially travel to the emergency exit level so in most circumstances would be the ground floor um, the lift will automatically go out of service the lift doors will open and they'll remain open until the fire um, system has been reset and the lift is deemed safe to go back into service. We then have in 8172 firefighting lifts. So this lift, this is an accreditation required for a full verified firefighting lift. Firefighting personnel can have full control over the lift via a firefighting switch which when activated cancels out the fire alarm triggered and allows the fire service to have full access and use of the lift. So if we go to the next slide, please. So building requirements. We'll now go over the basic building requirements for a firefighting lift, including what we have found being forgotten in the design of new buildings. As an example, we recently undertook a project in London for a two core building apartments and we were called in after the shafts had already been constructed and there was no water regress or raised floors. So we had to tackle the project using our experience working with existing buildings and we have full case studies and so on on our website. Next slide please Dean. So what are the requirements and when do we need to specify for a firefighting lift? So in this illustration here, we have the blue line, which would be essentially the ground floor in this instance, um, and that would be the fire service access level. So we would require a firefighting lift if the lift was to have a physical travel from ground floor to its most upper floor, of 18 metres or more, or if it was to go down to from ground floor down to basement levels of up to ten, over 10 metres. Um, and obviously as well, we need to have uh, stairs that travel along the lift. So to be to be fire protected to match the lift travel, which is obviously on here is highlighted in the orange. OK, next slide, please. So firefighting lobbies have a slight different requirement when it comes to multi occupancy. In this diagram, you can see the basic requirements for both. They're slightly different due to the high degree of compartmentation in multiple occupancy buildings. Any building that requires a firefighting lift would require a firefighting area. However, for buildings incorporating apartments, a firefighting stairwell is utilised instead. Generally, they would share a general corridor. As per the diagram, obviously other layouts are possible, um, but in general, all floors which are to be designated as firefighting floor would need these following guidelines. The firefighting lobby is incorporated to any general building and less serving apartments. You will see in the diagram illustrating the firefighting stairwell. From a building point, all of the walls and the access point of the walls 
and the access points of the area must have a fire rating of for 60 minutes unless the parting wall is a common is to accommodation which will then need 120 mi 20 minutes to create compartmentation. Buildings other than low rise buildings without a deep basement require additional facilities to enable the fire and rescue services to avoid delays. Reach fires, work near fires and to avoid to provide secure operating base. This includes provision of firefighting lifts, firefighting stairs and firefighting lobbies combined in a protection shaft described as a firefighting shaft, although not all firefighting shafts need to include a firefighting lift. This basically means a firefighting lobby for any building unless serving an apartment with a common corridor. Also, all lets from a fire main located in the firefighting lobby or in the case of a lift shaft serving apartments in a firefighting stairwell. These are required on all floors that are designed as a firefighting floor. So points to remember, outlets for a fireman should be located in a fire lobby when a lift shaft is serving apartments when a lift shaft is a serving apartment, it would be located in the firefighting stairwell. In accordance with BS 5588-5 2004, smoke control should be provided and the lift shaft should be constructed generally in, in accordance with clauses 7 and 8 of BS 5588-5 2004. Um, next slide please, Dean. So building requirements. As an example, in, recent, in a recent project, the secondary power supply was placed on the roof of a building due to, the, due to being in the last place a fire would reach. Encased in a fire protected surround that ensures a two hour safe period protecting from fire if one did manage to reach the location, which would provide adequate time for firefighters to evacuate and save the building. Other requirements are air speed. Um, air speed into a lift shaft needs to be minimised to avoid excessive swaying of travelling cable or compensation means. Any landing doors which are not intended to be used by firefighters and which do not have a safe area shall be protected by fire shutter or a fire door that would be linked to a fire alarm. Fire assessment would determine which floors would and would not be used for firefighting use and floors deemed as not must be protected by the means of a fire shutter or fire door that would be linked to the fire alarm. Dedicated lift shaft. If you look at the diagram, you can see that the shafts are for a normal passenger lift and one dedicated for a firefighting lift. The dedicated lift shaft is required due to being on a fire compartment. It also provides safety for the fire surface, reducing the risk of, fail of falling due to the isolation with the surrounding shaft, along with reduced air movement being a single shaft. Uh, next slide, please, Dean. So other building requirements. The main challenge is how we move the water from the lift pit. This is more challenging than existing buildings due to the lack of design being incorporated for lift pit drainage. However, we also came across this in new builds where we are called upon for a solution as it hasn't been incorporated into the building design. So we have three illustrations here. First one is raised floors. This would be obviously in front of every door entrance um, and would help direct water away from going into the lift shaft. Number two is the drainage channel, which would sit and be incorporated in front of the doors on each, each level. And then number three is a sump pump. Um, this is really to be used as a last resort um, and if the other two options here couldn't couldn't be um, 
done, but raised floors would be the preferred. Um, so next, next one, please. So let's look at the requirements of a firefighting lift and what makes them different from other passenger lifts. Next slide, please. So lift requirements, emergency intercom and operation systems. A different intercom and operation system is used on a firefighting lift with the components you see as an addition. An LMS system is used to ensure clear communication is available for the evacuation persons and firefighting team. So LMS is a lift monitoring system. Power supply LMS unit can, can be used to send LMS messages through a telephone. LMS messages are triggered by events defined in the entrance unit. Car station, this is a requirement. Um, LMS obviously is a required thing that you need to have. Uh, car station is recommended. It's a microphone and speaker unit for the lift car installation. Um, obviously, you'd only have one of these for a lift car. Um, and then the third one is the, emerg the entrance station, which is required. This is a, um, a master unit of the system. All commands and logic is handled by the entrance unit. Max two entry stations can be connected per system. Um, next slide, please, Dean. OK, firefighting lift requirements. Additional featured requirements for a firefighting lift include the lift would have to reach the top floor within 60 seconds from the firefighters access level. So generally from ground floor. However, for lifts with high travel, more than 200 metres. This time to reach the highest landing may be increased by one second for each three metres additional travel. Um, note that not even the shard lift is that much travel. So as long as you remember the 60 seconds to the top floor of the lift, the lift company will calculate the speed for you. Electrical devices on landings are designed to work correctly in ambient temperatures with a range of 0 degrees C to 65 degrees C. The lift to be able to operate safely for two hours. If main power failure and be protected by fire. And if travel distance between floors are greater than seven metres, intermediate doors are required, which would provide obviously emergency access if the lift was to ever stop between the two floors. And next slide, please, Dean. So some of the components of that are within a firefighting lift. So picture one here is an emergency trap door. This is fitted to the car roof with a minimum size of 400 millimetres by 500 millimetres, which is operated by an IP electrical switch. We then have a ladder that is housed within the lift car. Um, this is obviously to allow for safe exit through the roof. Um, we then have on the next one a ladder for the outer car. Um, this is obviously for firefighters use. Um, this would help with getting access to from the lift roof to um, access onto a landing level. Um, and then we have firefighter switch um, located at the fire service access level and the entrance station, so generally ground floor. And then all electrical switches are all IPX3 rated. Um, next switch, please. Uh, next one, please. So lift requirements. So for a firefighting lift, it can be a minimum of eight persons, with 13 person being the most common. So eight person would be 630 kg, 13 person being 1000 kg. Um, depending on the company used, the minimum requirement size of a lift shaft for a firefighting lift 
would be 1650 wide by 1750 deep. Um, and that would allow for um, that would allow for an, an eight person 630 kg lift. Um, however, this can obviously vary with with different lift companies. And so I'd say that within 100 millimeters, most companies would be able to comply with that. Um, the internal lift car dimensions would need to be 1100 millimeters wide by 1400 millimeters deep, and that's to meet the regulations. And the lift car entrances to so the door openings would need to be a minimum of 800 millimetres. And obviously in the picture there you can see a typical layout of a lift um, showing the, the relevant um, pieces there. OK, next slide please. So challenges with existing buildings. Many of the UK's high rise buildings have been built prior to the EN81 regulations and even before BS 5655 and its predecessor BS 2655, which is from the early 70s. Before BS CP3 and BS 2655, lift design was a matter for architects, building design approval, and customer requirements. There were some more standards and guidelines available, not, but not in a format of nationally approved specification. Many high rise tower built blocks in the UK predate any national approved standards. This, this needs to be considered in future developments of existing buildings and a key understanding is required to ensure safety and complacency. Um, next slide please. So challenges of existing buildings, this is an example of a project that we that we undertook. Um, this is a grade one listed building in London. Um, it was a project we undertook and the building status was changing from an office to a 166 bedroom hotel. Fire assessment dictated a firefighting lift was required due to the meter vertical travel of the lift and the design of the building. Highlighted the restricted access to the back of the building for actual firefighters and their equipment, which meant other elements were required, such as a water hose outside the lift because of the distance between the fire service access and the entrance to the lift. And you can see here that the, the red is the, the access, the orange dash line is the, the travel and the, the path the firefighters would take to the, the far corner where the brown um, square is our firefighting lift. Um, so this is just one example of many and obviously I'm sure many of you have seen lots of different challenges within different buildings. Um, next slide please Dean. So Existing builds hold greater challenges when incorporating a firefighter lift. Iconic lifts would advise seeking advice to avoid delays and additional expense that could be avoided from a lift consultant or from a lift company you choose. In this instance, we cannot stress enough how important it is to use a company with Schedule 18 when requiring lifts for existing buildings. With at least three different categories of lifts provided for the fire service use, it, challenge, it causes challenges for the fire and rescue teams, such as establishing if they have a suitable lift for use and recognition of the type of level of protection and functionality available. Please note fire service is reluctant to use lifts prior to serve fire service this described as BS 5588-5. So identifying lift standards and how they are used. The label show identifies the lack of essential protection such as fire resistant structures, secondary power supply and water management. They assist with identifying if the lift might be a fireman's lift, a firefighting lift or firefighters lift. 
BS8899 includes an informative Annex B which summarises past provisions for lifts with operation and event of fire which have been around since 1970. To be classed as a firefighter's lift, the lift would need to fully comply to BS EN 8172. In this instance, the firefighter's picture of BS EN 8170 can be used, which can be shown in figure one. To be classed as a firefighting lift, the modernised lift would, need, would have to fully comply to BS 5588-5. However, the last version, BS 5588-5-2014, references BS EN 8172-2003. In this instance, and if the lift doesn't fully comply, to Ian 8172, then the label as stated in BS 8899-2016 should be used as shown in figure two. Any lift that has been modernised for fire service and does not fully comply with either firefighters lift or firefighting lift is a modernised lift for fire service use as defined in BS 8899. This is a lift primarily intended for passenger use, which has been modernised with at least basic protection, controls, signal, signal measures that allow it to be used under the direct control of the fire service. In this instance, the firefighter picture must not be used on the label shown, and the label should be used instead, figure two. So if a fully verified firefighters lift in an existing building, the main no. obstacle the company no. space, um, Sorry about that. Um, to obtain fully firefighting lifts in an existing building, the main obstacle lift companies face is the size of the lift car. Some lift companies are able to maximise the space and achieve a larger lift car. There are many challenges and are the most important ones to understand. Um, next slide, please, Dean. So how to specify a firefighter, firefighter lift. Once a firefighter lift has been determined, it's highly recommended to seek consultation with a lift specialist or lift consultant who understands firefighter lifts at an early stage. As we still come across challenges, even with new buildings, Having the basic understanding of the information a lift company's needs to manufacture a firefighting lift will aid your project greatly. Um, next slide, please. So specifications for the size of the lift. A firefighting lift can be a minimum of eight person with 13 persons being most common. Depending on the company you use, um, Lift shaft sizes are 1650 wide by 1750 deep, uh, with a minimum car of 1100 by 1400, and minimum entrance of 1800 wide. This would fully comply with in 8172. Uh, next slide, please. So, how to specify a fire firefighting lift. The lift requirements that you have learned today will include will be included once you specify a firefighting lift. Additionally, the following information would save you time and money if it can be provided. So the lift company you choose when commissioning a firefighting lift to ensure a smooth installation. So number one, number of lifts required. Assess then you have the correct number and type of lifts planned. Number two, the size of the lift shaft and area. The area available for the lift shaft or the lift shaft size. The headroom and the pit size is available. You may have to look at modernisation if there is no sufficient space to achieve a firefighter accreditation. Number three, speed requirements. Speed of the lifts to reach the top floor within 60 seconds. However, for lifts with higher travelled more than 200 metres, 
the time to reach the highest landing should increase by one second for each three meter additional travel. As an example, this is a very rare even the shard, as we've said before. Standards needs to be required. Additional standard required, such as evacuation, anti-vandal, if the lift has adequate access for firefighter or additional features may be required at the landing. And number five, secondary power source. What secondary power source is available? Is it fire rated? Where will it be located? A backup power source that comes from a generator, UPS battery backup or a secondary main supply, which we find is the most, the most common. Power supplies are then routed to a changeover switch, which is generally automatic and comes in many seconds after a mains power failure have been switched off. And then last one, what number of firefighting access floors are required? So what floors will be assessed by a firefighter? This is important as they may require additional components to be included on each floor and may affect the building's design. Water hydrants may also be possible to access requirements where the lift is located and the main entrance of the building. Access floor communication and landing operation, operating push button IP rating for water uh, and for continuous operation. Uh, next slide. OK, and that's the end of my presentation. Um, well, thank you all for listening to me. Um, obviously, on the page here, there's a email address. So if there's any questions that may come through um, or you want to send, send us some information, then please send it through and we'll obviously answer as many questions as we can. Brilliant. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Um, if everyone takes samples details, if you do have more questions, and I'll try and go through some now that have come up in the chat. Um, firstly, Paul, what is the difference that we should expect in maintenance of a passenger lift and a firefighting lift? Um, so the maintenance, obviously, is a, it's, it's slightly more where we need to um, obviously check on the firefighting parts of the of the lift. But in general, it, the maintenance isn't great a, a lot more. It's more about checking that the when on a service visit that we make sure the firefighting equipment works and is operational. So it's more of a check than a, a physical, um, any physical work that needs to be done. It's making sure that it operates. And should we expect the certification to state that that's been checked or is it just a visual check that isn't noted down? No, it's noted down. So, for instance, obviously, I can't talk for every lift company out there, but we have a, a checklist, um, which is um, basically a, a, a service sheet and it, it has all of these items on. So we will tick that which items have been checked and obviously any items that are not applicable because not all lifts have everything on them. Um, we will obviously cross out. Um, Thank you. And just to confirm, some people did answer it, but just to ensure that the sump is maintained by a third party company, not the lift engineers. Is that correct? Sorry, say that again, Dana. The pump, the pump is serviced. Uh, is it? Hold on. The sump pump is serviced separately by a third party company, not the lift engineers. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So the sump pump would always sit outside of the lift shaft, never inside. Um, but that would be something that would be serviced by a third party company, yes. OK, brilliant. Um, we're hearing of um, some guidance about having two cores. Do you know of any guidance yet about what them um, for residential buildings over 30 metres uh, with two staircases and two cores? Do you know of any guidance for that yet? Um, no, not off the top of my head, I don't. But that's something that we can look into and if we if I can find any information on that, then I can um, send that across. Brilliant. OK, thank you very much. Um, what is the differences that we should expect to find in a firefighting lift and an escape lift? I think that might be an evacuation lift. OK, um, so they're, they're two very different lifts. Um, so an evacuation lift is basically it, it has a secondary power supply, so it, 
works similar in, in that instance that it will have a changeover switch. Um, and then on every landing, you have a um, have a, a, a basically a control station so you can communicate between and the lift can be then used by trained operat operatives to evacuate people from a building. OK, brilliant, thank you. Um, just see what else we've got here. Um, how do you uh, deal with the compromise between vandalism and security for the access hatch in the lift? Um, so obviously they're, they're lockable with with um, a lift key, um, which is generally a triangle key. Um, and they generally sit quite flush in the ceiling. Um, and I can't say that I've ever had any vandalism on them, if I'm truthful. Um, but yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer that one. Yeah, I don't think I've come across any vandalism in in the lifts. Maybe it's just not common knowledge that that um, that that access hatch is there, so therefore people don't really tamper with it. Yeah. Um, okay. Have you? Have there been any known issues between the speaker and intercom in a fire fine lift at access level? Not that I've ever in, encountered. No. Okay. Brilliant. I think that is mainly all the questions. Um, I did have one. The signage that you spoke about, so if we haven't managed to meet all of the criteria, that checklist sign, what British standard is it that says that we need that signage? Um, so that signage, it was, let me just get, I'll give you so many BS numbers there. Yeah. <laughs> They're all muddled up now. Um, Sorry, bear with me a second. So that one's it's covered under BS 5588-5. Brilliant, thank you. Because I think a lot of the time they try to design it, but where it um, deviates, I think it is important to highlight what is there and what isn't. Yes, definitely. OK, where a lift in a high rise is being replaced or out of service or broken, what measures should we be introducing while that lift is out of service? It's a very difficult one because if there's only one lift that's a firefighting lift in a building, then obviously we need to get it fixed as soon as possible. Um, the reason for a firefighting lift is is so obviously things can be fires can be dealt with and people can be evacuated and so on as 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 needed. Um, Again, I don't really know how to answer that one because you just need to get it fixed as soon as possible, I suppose, because you can't just all of a sudden swap the lift over and put a new one in in its replacement. Um, you have to inform. You have to inform the fire brigade as well. Yeah, okay. when, yeah. There's the new requirements that if it's going to be out of service for 24 hours, so the brigade could come up with other measures. I'd yeah. also say maybe your fire risk assessor, maybe an engineer, could look at other ways if it was. Uh, you know, long term, something else that you might need in place to replace it. You, there'd be the people rather than the lift, lift engineers to consider what could be put in place for that. Yeah. Um, and also, go on, man. Sorry, just quickly. And also the ATS switch, which is the transfer switch that is serviced by a third party as well. Because okay. from the electrical side. Mm hmm. Thanks, Wayne. I'll tell Wayne off afterwards for talking instead of using the chat. Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's luckily I know him, so I can have a kind word later. <laughs> I apologise. No problem. Um, <laughs> OK, I've got one more question in the chat. Is a push to talk button required on the firefighters key switch at the fire service access level? There is a push to talk on there, yes. OK, brilliant. I think that is all of the questions for today. Um, as I said, my apologies for all of the technical difficulties we have had. Um, we couldn't stop the popping up of people in the lobby. Um, I know it was a bit distracting, but in the next couple of days, the recording will be available. And please take down Paul's um, details if you do have any further questions. Yeah, and I'll happily answer as many as I possibly can. Brilliant. Thank you very much again, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. No problem. Thank you, Dana. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dana. Thank <laughs> you.